It's too early. <laughs> I've got seven o'clock here on my side. We are recording. Thank you. All right, uh, everyone, welcome uh, to our weekend meeting, our monthly meeting here. We got rained out, of course, and uh, we're doing this uh, all virtual this evening. Um, I got a few announcements to make. One, I want to, to, as we were just talking about a moment ago, the Dark Sky Festival was a huge success. And Bruce, accolades to you for organizing this thing. To organize something on this scale and have it come off with nary a hitch is a feat in and of itself. So kudos to you for all the planning uh, that you put into this. Uh, I got excellent feedback from everyone that I talked to and I talked to lots of people and I was always asking them, well, what did you think about it? How are you having a good time? Everyone, unanimously, everyone was having a great time. Uh, so do you have anything uh, you want to note about the, uh, the event? Well, <laughs> I want to thank everybody that's on this call that participated, that's for sure. Uh, and particularly Jeff, who emceed everything mm -hmm. and, and became de facto uh, and now is going to be de jure uh, co-chair <laughs> going forward. Uh, and Chris Thody, who yeah. Jeff and I both uh, agree it was the MVP of the event. Uh, in the background, but making sure stuff worked. I concur and, with that. Yep. And happened, yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, half the people on this call were at that festival, and we had um, we had about uh, 250 people out on 20 over 20 scopes on Friday night, and almost that many on Saturday night. Uh, in addition to great daytime programming, so. It's uh, really fun. We're, I think the consensus is emerging that we will give it a whirl again next year. Yeah, I like, I, the, way Chris, I like the way Chris is lingering in the shadows even here tonight on our Zoom call. Mm -hmm. you know, he, he deserves to have a bright light shine, shining on him. He did a great job. I tell you, it was windy Saturday, and Chris stood up there and held the TV screen that we were using for our, our speeches the whole time so it wouldn't blow over. Yeah, he and Robert did that. Yes, I thought that was uh, very, very, uh, how should you say? Uh, Self-sacrifice. I, I was going to say just wonderful selfless. thing to do. Self Selfless. That's a good word. Thank you, Darcy. Selfless work. And uh, it was great. It was. I, I got to say one more thing, and that is I've heard a lot of people tell me how much fun they had with uh, uh, Daryl's uh, uh, Constellation Tours. Right. And the other one, the kids loved uh, Bill's uh, bubble blowing. In fact, I don't know who took the picture. There's a wonderful picture of Bill with this very complex bubble in front of him. It is just a fantastic picture. We got to save that one for our club and put it on the website because <laughs> he looks great in that. Have you ever, has anyone else seen that picture? I've oh, yeah. Seen that. Uh, oh, that yeah. Is it's an on awesome Facebook. Picture. It's on Facebook. It is an awesome picture. He's got this big smile across, but you're looking at him through these bubbles. <laughs> I'll check it out. Uh, and I, for the very first time ever, I was able to get a picture of the Milky Way just with my cell phone. I mean, I just held it up, clicked it, and it, it's not a great picture by any means, but it is mine, and mm -hmm. I'm proud of it. So, yeah, for those of you who didn't go, and you you, know, you need to go next year or go anytime up there. Uh, it's it's a great place, and a great time. Uh, the naked mm -hmm. eye observation was awesome. Been in the sky that dark. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Daryl came back to the house and he taught me everything that John had taught him <laughs> about photo enhancement. <laughs> and I got a picture of the Milky Way, too. All right. Um, we're going to move on. And uh, I have a few announcements to make. Uh, our next star party is on the 19th of November. Uh, it'll go from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. And I hope uh, we have some volunteers for that. Uh, that's our last star party for the year. We don't begin again until March of next year. So where's that star party at, Daryl? Woolly Hollow. That's at Woolly Hollow, okay. Yeah, just outside of Greenbrier. Six o'clock. And they have pretty good dark skies there as well. So yeah, please come out. Six to 8 p.m. Uh, then on the 26th is our monthly club meeting and uh, that'll start at 6 p.m. Uh, for the Supper Bowl. And then I have an event that's coming up. Well, we have an event because we were invited to this. Uh, 
A friend of mine named Rachel Miller, Dr. Rachel Miller, is the director of the Arts and Sciences Center in Pine Bluff. And they are having a art exhibition uh, for an artist named Nick Hobbs. Uh, his name is Nick Hobbs, and he does uh, works on graphite, and he does a lot of space-themed, celestial-themed uh, objects in his art, a lot of great stuff at the moon. Get a chance, look him up on the internet. Uh, Nick Hobbs, or BBS, and he does have a little website where you can look at some of his art. But anyway, they're going to have an um, exhibition of his work, and um, from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m., Rachel would like for us to come out and set up some telescopes for the VIPs and for people that are uh, just visitors to the museum. Uh, she said that a lot of the kids that live in that area uh, have never looked through a telescope, and uh, she would like to give them that opportunity. So if you can come, uh, that would be great. I would really deeply appreciate it from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. I'll post uh, or send out another email before too long uh, with more detailed information. But they've set aside an observing field next to the museum uh, where we can set up. There's a, a electricity access. Uh, they're going to feed us. There's going to be pizza. There'll be uh, beverages, uh, just about anything we need. Um, any questions? Day the date again? That is on the 10th of November. What, is it going to be dark enough to see anything? Uh, yeah, the sun sets at 5.30 something, and then we go from uh, 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. So we'll get some shots of the moon. Uh, I mean, not the moon, but Jupiter and Saturn uh, later in the evening. So it is what it is, but yeah. Okay. Anyway, uh, let's see. Then on November 8th, we have a total lunar eclipse. Um, this will be the last one until the year 2025. So don't miss out on this. Uh, clouds permitting, I hope we get to see it. Uh, the penumbral uh, eclipse begins at 2.02 a.m. Uh, partial begins at 3.09. Uh, the full eclipse is at 4.16 a.m. And then it ends by 5.41. So yeah, you're gonna have to be up really early uh, or very late depending on how you wanna look at that. Uh, <laughs> deserve it. But anyway, it'll be worth looking at, believe me. Uh, then on, uh, November 17th is the Leonid meteor shower. And as a lot of you already know, it's, it's not a great show typically, but every 33 years or so, um, it has been known to have some outbursts uh, and produce meteor storms where there's been a thousand to a hundred thousand meteors uh, uh, recorded uh, over these, uh, every 33 years. And uh, in some of those events, people were, seeing so many meters, they had the illusion that the earth was like shooting off into space and they were actually dropping down to the ground and grabbing hold of it. <laughs> That's not predicted to happen this time, but a couple of meteorists who've been studying the dynamics of these meteor streams produced by Comet Temple Tuttle um, have looked at a stream that uh, was produced in 1733. They believe the earth is gonna pass through it. And two of these independent uh, meteorists have come up uh, with the idea that uh, we're going to see an outburst. And one of them, a Russian guy is predicting, uh, I think like 250 per hour. Uh, then there's a Japanese guy who's saying uh, 50 per hour. So there's a big discrepancy there. Uh, it's not an exact science in predicting how these things are going to turn out, but meteorists have been getting better at doing this over the years. So who knows, but it might be worth checking out. And, uh, but the outburst is predicted to occur on the 19th of November. And it's at 6 a.m. UT time. And if I've converted that right, I think it's 1 a.m. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but anyway, that's something to keep in mind and keep your eye out for. So the Leonids on the 17th, the outburst predicted on the 19th. Uh, a few other announcements. One, Bruce, do we have a uh, cleanup party at the um, uh, observatory next weekend? Is that, is that right? Yeah, work party next weekend. We'll uh, get closer and see what the weather is. To what what day we'll do it, but one afternoon, Saturday or Sunday, we need to need to do some things to okay. catch up with things. Okay. Uh, let's see. And then there's the annual leadership uh, volunteer survey. Are you going to? Yeah, that? I'm going to try to get that out. I'm, uh, I've lost uh, uh, contact or connect. I can't get, I can't log on to our uh, survey monkey site, but I'll get that solved tomorrow. I hope certainly in the next day or two. And uh, we'll get that survey out. We do that every year and uh, looking for volunteers and 
and uh, people who are interested in, in uh, holding positions in the club is a great way to, to, uh, to get involved in the club is, is, is to, uh, is to take a position of some sort or another. It doesn't have to be an office, but we've got lots of roles to fill. And even if you think the job is filled, it's good. I try to convince people they need to take the survey and tell us what they're interested in, even if they don't think that job is currently vacant, because you never know what happens. We'll get that out pretty soon. And then we'll have nominations for awards coming up soon too annual award, uh, 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 club awards, observer of the year, uh, club club service volunteer. Uh, I can't remember them all. We've got four awards we give out. Outreach. Outreach award and student of the year. If rarely give that one, but if you know a young person that's uh, doing interesting things in astronomy and nominate them. All right, I think that covers everything that I had to say. Is there any other club announcements that need to be made? Or well, one made? is I'm glad to see Greg Hurley. We haven't seen him in a yeah. while. Welcome back. Bill uh, Platt. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> Bill Platt will be here on the 14th. You would think I would remember that since I'm responsible for getting him here. Uh, but Bill Plate uh, will be at the Ron Rob Theater on uh, the 14th of November, and he's going to be talking about uh, the Great American Eclipse. Uh, his program begins at 7 p.m. This is all free. Uh, the ASGC has paid for his travel here, and uh, the Central Arkansas Library System is providing us with the theater to host him. Uh, he'll be doing a book signing afterwards. So if you're not familiar with Phil Plate, he's known as the Bad Astronomer. He does a blog. Uh, uh, called Bad Astronomy. He's had a couple of books out. He's on TV all the time. Uh, How the Universe Works on Discovery Channel. Uh, he's done the cra PBS's Crash Course Astronomy. He's involved in a lot of different things, and he's a great speaker, always entertaining, uh, and very informative. So please uh, join us for that on the night of the 14th of November, 7 p.m. Well, I'll tell you what, if he's coming here to talk about the eclipse, he's He's got a lot of work cut out for him. He does, of, yeah. I don't think he can beat Carl and Darcy. <laughs> <laughs> he's working behind the curve. Right, right. He if, he's, if he's the bad astronomer, Carl and, and Darcy are the baddest. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I, that's all I've got. And if there's anything else. Okay. Michael, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Okay. Let's see if I can share my screen. Before you get started, I'm going to remind everyone, please mute your microphones at this point. Hey, Daryl, one thing. Do we have new people here on, on oh, tonight, our visitors? Right. Anyone new? If you are, chime in right now. Let us know who you are, where you're from, how you found us. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, my name is Ted Howard. I'm a new member of the uh, uh, CAAS. Uh, I don't know what you guys call yourself. Is there a quick way to say it? Cass. <laughs> Cass. Cass. Okay. Yeah. Um, so now yeah, you're a Cassiopeian. I'm sorry. You're, you're a Cassiopeian now. Oh, very good. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I will wear it proudly. <laughs> so uh, no, I mean I'm a newbie. Uh, I, I, compared to you guys, so you guys sound very advanced. But I look forward to getting to your level at some point. But um, yeah, I, I I took an astronomy class in college many many <clears throat> years ago and uh, fell in love with the <clears throat> telescope. And then I guess I let life get in the way and I stopped using it for a long time. So I'm really looking forward to getting my telescope out. And I, I, I could use some help in, in relearning uh, uh, how to use the telescope. And, and ultimately I wanna get into astrophotography. Great. Well, remember now, this is not a competition as to who knows how much or we're, I mean, we all, I'm still learning. I've been doing this for a number of years now, but I'm still learning. And that's the great part of this hobby. You are always learning something, uh, but never feel like you're, you're behind in the way of knowledge over other people or they're over you. Uh, just absorb. When I joined, I didn't know anything like you. I, I was a complete newbie. I didn't know Saturn from Uranus. And it was... I, I just started absorbing by osmosis a, a lot of the information these people had. And uh, I've had a lot of great mentors in the club. So uh, yeah, we will be uh, more than happy to help you out. 
Well, that's great. I'm I'm just looking forward to it because it's it's a lot of fun. Well, Ted, you stick around long enough, you'll get where I am, and that is you're forgetting as much as you're learning. So it you sort of, sort of stall out. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Yes. <laughs> we just keep on going. Yeah. Right. Yep. Okay. Is there anyone else new? Uh, hi. Um, I'm not really new, but I've been a member for a, a few years and I haven't attended in a long time. I thought I'd try to reconnect a little bit. Uh, Joe, Joe Meehan. Joe, we've been keeping up with your absence. <laughs> we, we were wondering if you were ever going to come back around. Well, thank you. It looks like things are going great. That's good. <laughs> good to hear. We're, we're glad to have you back. Okay. Anyone else? I don't recognize Abigail. Have we seen Abigail before? Hi, guys. Yeah, I joined um, earlier this year. I've come to a couple oh, meetings. I've come to, I mostly come to the star parties. Um, but I love listening to all of you guys talk about the sky. So I love it. So have you gotten to use your telescope that you borrowed? So no, I haven't come up and picked it up. And oh. also, I wanted to know if the Pope County Library had joined your guys's telescope um, system. Well, you can uh, meet with me anytime and we can get one of the scopes to you and you can do as you will with it. Awesome. I, I don't think the Pope uh, County Library system has. See, I need to get them connected. How do I do that? Okay. Do I give right. them your information? Uh, or Alan, your information? Uh, Alan Stabe is a member and he runs the telescope project. Awesome. Okay. Sounds great. But, but you email. Want to reinforce to them that <clears throat> when they get involved, <clears throat> it's no cost on their part. Uh, the ASGC, Arkansas Space Grant Consortium, provides the funding and uh, we modify the scopes. And uh, yeah, so it would be no cost to, to the library. But we also have six telescopes available that we loan out to club members in a telescope loan program, and three of them are not loaned out at the present time. So, so I need to come email me. I'll let you know what we got, and you can I'll arrange to get it to you. That sounds perfect. Thank All you. All right. You're very welcome. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Well, welcome, everyone. And Michael, the show is now. All right. Here. Let's see if we can get the other sharing done. So you guys can see my screen, I hope. So the uh, title is Inexpensive Approaches to Electronically Assisted Astronomy and Digital Astrophotography. So what I've learned from many people who have um, borrowed telescopes from our, our loan program the expectations that they had really exceed the reality for what they see in the telescopes. For example, many people expect an amateur telescope to show them what they see in the astronomy books or what they see online from, <laughs> believe it or not, from the Hubble telescope. <laughs> and it's like, not quite. So in reality, you'll find many objects appear disappointingly dim and lack detail in smaller amateur telescopes. When I mean that things under 12 inches, when they're observed visually, and uh, the telescopes cannot gather sufficient light to provide book-like images. And this is especially true when people are using their telescopes in towns like you know, Little Rock and in Benton and in uh, Conway, where the light pollution is so great. They'll have a better view of it if they go up to the Buffalo River, as many people discovered this last weekend. It's a big, big difference. And of course, if you go up to our uh, RRO, uh, River uh, Ridge Observatory, and it's a much darker sky. You can actually see the Milky Way very well. And uh, for example, John Reed has posted recently some beautiful pictures of the Milky Way taken from the RRO. All right. So going from there, I will say that if you view inside the city, some objects do not disappoint. The moon is always spectacular. Here's a picture I took with my six inch F5 uh, reflector. And it's always easy to get good images of the moon. And you can play around with different settings on the, uh, for, to enhance the, uh, the, the image, either in Photoshop or Photoshop Essentials or something like that. And it's a fun thing. You can change your magnification and it's always good. You can even get good images of the moon with a 
simple camera and a telephoto lens. Uh, you can get good images even with a Dobsonian telescope because the exposures are so short, much less than a second, you don't need a sidereal drive. So moon photography is open to everybody. The planets, most planets put on a good show. As we've seen uh, people when they come to the uh, star parties we have, Jupiter is putting on a spectacular show right now, as is Saturn, and Mars keeps getting bigger as it approaches opposition. So these turn out to be very good. Even in a, as small as a three inch telescope, you can see great details and you can photograph and image them if you like. Uh, bright and double stars, uh, Albireo. I mean, how many people were just awed by the appearance of Albireo up at the uh, Dark Sky Festival? It was amazing. And I also went to the University of Illinois, and that is actually the official double star of the University of Illinois because our school colors are orange and blue. So that's always good. Epsilon Lyra, the double double in, uh, in Lyra. It's a beautiful thing, and it's uh, really cool to see two double doubles. Uh, one of my favorite clusters, and I showed it to people up at the Buffalo River, is the Owl Cluster in Cassiopeia. It's a beautiful cluster with many different, different colors, and it really does look like the shape of an owl. If you look at it, you see the two eyes, the body, and then here's the wings. And then M41 is a beautiful open cluster. So these don't disappoint as bad. Where the disappointment tends to come in is when people go after faint nebula, galaxies, and even some globular clusters. So I took some images here and I didn't stack them too much. I tried to make them look like what they appear to in my telescope in my Little Rock neighborhood. And so M1, you can just barely see a little gray thing here. And so that's a nebula, the Crab Nebula. M3 is a globular cluster and you kind of see something and you can see a couple of individual stars, but it's not particularly big. M101 is a galaxy. You can see the nucleus of the galaxy right here. It appears quite bright, but it really is a stretch to see anything. One time I was making a, a, a picture of M101 and uh, of course uh, my good friend, John Reed came over and he goes, gray blob. <laughs> and so then of course, when I was later on doing M33, he goes, bigger gray blob. And that's what it kind of looks like even from the RRO, it's not spectacular. M42 is a little better. You can actually see in the area where the trapezium is, you can see a little bit here and there, but it's not very distinct. And remember, we rarely see colors on these nebula and galaxies because they're so dim that the cones or the color receptors in our retina can't pick them up. So we're really seeing them with our rods in our, in our retina, which are strictly black and white, okay? So a couple other things, M51, you can see the two nuclei of both galaxies, but not much else. And M97, the Owl Nebula, you can catch a little bit of it, maybe even a little bit of the dark spots that represent the eyes of the owl. So one of the ways out of this, and it is called Electronically Assisted Astronomy or EAA. And this is when you use either an analog or digital camera in place of a, an eyepiece, or, uh, or uh, on your telephoto lens or a telescope. And the camera sensors, especially the new ones, the CMOS sensors are so much more sensitive to light than the human eye, you're gonna see much more. Uh, and you also take advantage of these software packages like SharpCat that allow you to get multiple images and stack to create a live stacked image for observation. And each time you stack it, the stacking produces sharper images by reducing random noise, but they do not increase the image brightness. For that, you have to play around with the camera in terms of its gain and the exposure time. Okay, so stacking just gets you better uh, going there. So why use EAA? Well, you can see colors as you'll see in a few seconds with some pictures and details not visible by optical observ observation. And the images that show up on your computer and then which you can then put them on a bigger screen like a bigger monitor or a TV are more like what you see in a book, even with a, something as small as a four or a six inch telescope. It also helps overcome light pollution. Again, cameras see image 
that are dimmer and more details than the human eye can pick out. Another advantage is multiple people can view objects at the same time. So you can have, instead of having one person at a time go up to the eyepiece on your telescope, five or six people or even more, it depends how big the screen you have is, can see the same object live at the same time. Another advantage, the object is always in focus. When you focus it and it's on your screen, it stays in focus, no one touches it. No need to for individuals to refocus because of differences in their glasses or anything like that. And hopefully some of you might pick up this talk on our website and you can see the uh, hyperlink I have there. It's a really good video primer for getting into EAA. The guy that does it just really explains it so well very simply, and it's something to get started with, okay? So electronically assisted astronomy and astrophotography are different, but related. So both use the cameras, but EAA is specifically for live observing, like at a star party, or if you're just yourself, if you say, I can't see a darn thing here where I'm at, you pump the camera in there and now you can observe. And like, and like as I said, it allows multiple people to see the imaged object. Now, astrophotography in the old days, I used film, uh, an analog device or digital uh, device to capture a permanent image, an image that you can then put on your computer or print out or do whatever you want. Sometimes I have one of my, uh, those things that uh, the picture frames that switched between images. And I got about 50 images that just kind of screen through the day and I walk around the house. I'm like, ooh, I remember taking that one. That's cool. All right. Permanent images can be acquired while using EAA. So while you're showing your neighbors, your friends or whatever, and you're live stacking, you can still save that image at the end and then try to use it in Photoshop or some of these many other processing programs to create a permanent image. So you're killing two birds with one stone. Okay, the bad news. EAA and astrophotography are not inexpensive. And there are really expensive ways to start. I've run into too many people, they buy the best equipment from the get-go, the telescope, the cameras, and they've, you know, they in the mount, and they've automatically blown almost uh, 4000 or $5,000. And a lot of them have realized that this aspect of the hobby is not for them. So the equipment gathers dust and money was wasted. What I'm going to show you is you can start with much less expensive equipment and gain experience to determine if you really like EAA and or astrophotography. And if you don't, just go back to what you were doing before visually, right? So people who like EAA and our astrophotography can just move forward with the equipment they have. Those who don't, can stop with less money wasted, okay? So required equipment. Well, you need a telescope or a telephoto lens, depending on what objects you want to Im image. So for, uh, you can use a telephoto lens or a wide field, uh, small telescope for low magnification images of the moon, large nebula, star fields, and the Milky Way. Again, go on, I encourage people, go on our, uh, Facebook page, a lot of people post beautiful, beautiful images. And if you really like them, you can copy them and save them to your computer. We don't have this thing where, you know, we're doing big copyright things. But again, I say, if you're ever going to use them for like in a talk or something, please give credit to the person that took it. I mean, they took the time to do it, give them the credit for it, okay? Now, if you want to do planets, open clusters, smaller nebula, et cetera, you do need a telescope. Do you need a monster telescope? No. Uh, I'm gonna show you some of the images I took with my six inch. Um, I think several people have been using what, 60 or 80 millimeter uh, refractors and are coming up with beautiful images, All right? Now you do need a laptop computer and or a larger screen, a monitor or a TV. You need image acquisition software, and I'll talk about a few of them, and they're free. You can download them and there's no cost. And there's also imaging processing software if you wanna do astrophotography, and there's a lot of free software available. So 
I'm going to focus mostly on using dedicated astrophotography cameras because I have zero experience using DSLRs and or the mirrorless cameras that you're used to, like a Canon or a Nikon or something like that. So uh, other people in the club have. And so I recommend that you talk to them. And a good way to do that is be on our listserv, send out questions. You'll be amazed how many people are so willing to not only answer you, but to engage you in conversation and to serve as a mentor for you, all right? So some very wild field images can be obtained using mounts without a sidereal drive. A sidereal drive is also called a clock drive. It would what turns your telescope or mount or your camera at the same rate that the earth turns on its uh, axis. And you can follow the object to make longer exposures. All right, telescopes are gonna require a mount with a sidereal drive or other means of tracking, all right? Especially if you're gonna be taking exposures longer than a few seconds. So now most people have a laptop, um, so there's no expense for that. And as I said, you can get started with the free image acquisition and processing software. Dedicated astrophotography cameras can be expensive, but, and there's a big but there. So here's one of my EEA setups. And what you can see is, and I set this up periodically in my neighborhood. I, I live in, uh, what's going to call it, uh, Hunter's Green Circle in Little, Little Rock. It's just off a of Napa Drive. It's a gated community. And my neighbors are like, like actually one of the younger people in this neighborhood, <laughs> my wife and I. But uh, I set this up so on a cool evening when people are taking out their evening walks, they stop by. So this is my, uh, here's my uh, six inch F5 Newtonian reflector. And I, sometimes I use my eight inch. You can see this is a small, camera. This is the uh, ASA 290MM uh, Mini. And that's one of the ones I'll talk about. And then I have my computer, my laptop, and I have a bigger screen here. And there's something for me to sit on while I'm doing all this. And the people walk by and they'll see what I have in. They'll take another lap around my neighborhood and they'll see, oh, what do I got this time? And I try to time it so they go to a different object each time they go around. People typically go around four or five times, which equals a little over a mile. And so they get to see at least four or five objects. And I'll actually end up with some people, they bring something to sit on, on my front lawn, and they wait for me to change to something else. And then they get up and they come and they look. So you can do this, not just on a star party, like the Pinnacle Mountain or anything, but just for your neighbors, all right? And they really appreciate it. All right, so choose your first camera wisely. Uh, so many cameras that are designed for lunar and planetary photography can also be used to image DSOs, which they don't talk about because they don't want to make these claims that go beyond their camera. And the price range of these is 120 to 350. And you can also get used cameras much less expensively by going onto websites like Cloudy Nights or others like that. And you run the risk, of course, you have to find somebody that has that's a reputable seller of used equipment. You know, sometimes you get something and it's like, eh, it doesn't really work. And you sometimes have a hard time getting them to refund your money, but that's the risk. Uh, but there are people that are well-known and they, they indicate who are the, you know, the more reliable sellers. So you should look into that. All right, several of these cameras can also be used as guide cameras. So as you get more, if you get more advanced in uh, EAA or in astrophotography in particular, you want to have finer guiding and you can get these mounts that you on your guide scope on the side of the camera or if you have an off, off axis guider you can use these cameras for that so it feeds back to your mount and tells you eh, we're a little off our, our studio drive needs some correction it corrects it to make better images so these cameras that you bought initially if you get more involved you don't have to get rid of them or sell them you just use them as your guide camera all right so um if DSO and other imaging uh, fails to interest you, you can use these cameras still for moon and planet photography, all right? So there's no wasted money there. So my recommendations and my experience is with the following three cameras. The ZW ASI 290mm Mini. It also can be used as a guide camera. It's 299 new, and it's available for most sites now. There was a short time where Astronomy equipment was really difficult to acquire during the early stages of the pandemic, but now all available. And you can get it for anywhere from 200 to $245 used. 
This is a camera that I think people scoff at, but I'll show you, I've taken some beautiful images with it. This is the SV Bonnie SV305, brand new. It's about $149, used as 100 to $120. It's a very good camera. And the SV Bonnie SV305 Pro, this one cannot be used as a guide camera, but this one can. You can see the port over here for doing the guide camera. And it's a little more expensive, but not much. So if you prefer, if you really think I might get into this more often, I would get this camera. Michael, can I interrupt yes. you just for a second? Sure, go ahead. Uh, can you explain to us uh, what a guide camera is? So I, I, th I thought I would mentioned it a little bit. So if you're going to use a guide camera and you really want to get into longer exposures with your uh, main camera, you usually use a guide scope. I have, a, I have an 80 millimeter guide scope on both of my uh, telescopes. And you put the camera in there instead of an eyepiece and that image is the field that you're, you're viewing. And then it plugs in. So you see there's a second plug here and you can plug directly into your mount and then using a program like what's called PhD2 or a few others, this camera image feeds into that program and that program looks to see how much it's deviating from the position it should be. And if it's drifting and it tells them out, uh, speed up or slow down a little bit to correct for the inaccuracy in your sidereal drive or clock drive. And you, you can use it either with guide scope or there's something called an off axis guider. So either way, it's a way of correcting for slight drifts in your sidereal drive, which are inherently there. All right, so if you're gonna be making exposures more than say about 40 seconds, you really do need a guide camera. At least that's been my experience. Others may speak up later and let them know what they found, but that's been my experience. Okay. So image acquisition. If you buy a ZWO camera, it has a free acquisition software that works with their cameras. It comes free is absolutely, I don't particularly care for it. <laughs> SV Bonnie recommends using SharpCat, which you have a free version or SharpCat Pro version, which is $15 uh, per year as a license fee. I personally use SharpCat Pro. The Polar Alignment Assistant and other features, there's a few like Focusing Assistant, they're, they themselves are worth the $15 fee. Uh, the Polar Alignment is very easy to do. It's, you use your camera as a guide camera on your guide scope takes about 10 minutes and you get excellent, excellent polar alignment. Now, another way to get, I recommend getting started, my friend, Dave Barrett, he is one of the founders of High Point Scientific. I've known David a long, long time. And he has a website about DSO imaging using the uh, a, ASI, that should be ASI, not just AI, 290mm mini with short exposure times. And I give you the hyperlink here. It shows you how to set up SharpCat, how to set up the camera, it gives you exposure times. It is a very, very detailed uh, primer and uh, tutor tutorial, and it's a good place to start. With e whatever camera you use, he has it specific for the 290mm, but I'm telling you, it, you can be applied to any simple camera to start out with. By using the short exposure times, you would eliminate the need for auto guiding. So you don't have to have a complex system and you can use exposures from anywhere from two or three seconds up to about 40 seconds without uh, having to do auto guiding, all right? So you can apply the same approach to the SV Bonnie camera. And I did that both and I'll show you some examples. So, so example, I recommend starting with very bright and easy to focus objects. One of the ones I recommend are the uh, globular clusters. So here are two images I took, this is M3 and M92, so, and uh, both globular clusters. And this was the, uh, the uh, ASI 290mm mini, which is a black and white camera only. So it's monocolor as they say. And then the two uh, objects down here, M3 and then M13 was with the SV305. And you can see, you can see colors, you can see orange and blue and other things in here. And the images, the comparable images here, you can see that the image, that the exact same exposure, all are 150 four second images stacked and a camera gain of 250. You can see, you'll see more here with the ASI 290mm because it, again, it's a monochrome camera and by putting the color elements onto the camera sensor reduces the camera sensitivity, 
All right. So if I wanted to try to match this one to here, I'd have to use either a higher gain and or a longer exposure. All right. But I just want to show this shows a good example here. What's the difference? And then you can move on to some brighter nebula. So this is again with the 290 mm mini. And oh, by the way, all these shots were taken from my front yard where I showed you that where I had my telescope. Um, these were all taken from here. And that's Bortle class eight, which is the light pollution level, which is pretty high. So this is M20, the Triffid Nebula. And this is M57, the Ring Nebula. Again, the same exposure conditions. And again, here's the Ring Nebula with the SV305, it's color. You can see some of the red fringe here, the central star, which is, uh, I think it's magnitude 17. So that's pretty good. And here's the dumbbell nebula. Here's the central star that created the nebula. And you can see the red fringes here. Pretty good images. And again, if you try to look at these with your naked eye, you can see them, but you're not gonna see this type of detail. Go boldly into galaxies, which look like gray blobs, and most of them are pretty invisible from here in Little Rock, or I would assume in Benton, as well as up in Conway or other places. I'll let John and uh, Rocky and others talk to you about that at the end of the meeting, at the end of my talk, rather. But this is, again, taken from Little Rock. This is M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, and this is M101, the Pinwheel Galaxy. You can see the great detail. All you can see from Little Rock in visual is the two cores of the galaxies and the core of this galaxy, as I showed you earlier. This is a big difference. I mean, again, people who have you know, complained to me, they call me up, I got my telescope and I wanted to see these galaxies and I can't see them. Well, yeah, you're right. Visually from in a Bortle seven or eight condition, you can't see it. But when you put this inexpensive camera on there, and again, relatively inexpensive, boom. This is what you see. And this actually looks pretty much what you'll see in a bunch of books. And I'm doing this with a six inch telescope. So that's what you can accomplish with some time. Now, as my <clears throat> friends and mentors who helped me out, this is not what my original images looked like. Uh, <laughs> they look pretty bad. But as I mentioned, I'll mention some of my mentors later, they were tolerant and patient with me, made good suggestions. And after a lot of practice, this is where I started moving up. So you can do this. So as I mentioned, the 290mm mini is much more sensitive to light than the SV305. Look at the detail in the background of the number of stars you see. Again, uh, I, stick, I stuck all throughout for 150 images stacked, four second images, in a camera game of 250. Now, I, it, what it turns out is with the SV305, it's, they, they, they divide their gain by 10, so it's 25, but it's the same thing. So you know, it's all the same gain. And you can see, you can see much more details with the monochrome camera than you can with the color camera, but the color camera gives you color. And that's something I like myself. I like the colors. And uh, it, whether observing by EAA or making a photograph. Again, you can move this to that more like you see here, but you got to go up here. I would probably go up to a 10 second exposure keeping the gain the same. And then this image with the SV305 would look more like this image here. Okay. Oh, acquiring images is pretty straightforward. You got to practice hard with focusing. That's very imperative. Uh, so you can use a Bakhtinov mask, or I prefer to use the focusing assistant that is in part, in part of Sharp, SharpCat Pro. It really puts up a histogram and you just keep monitoring your focus until you get it as narrow as possible and you get it. And then it's really good. It's good focusing. It takes about two minutes. And the good thing about it is if you have a good focuser and you can lock it in position, when you move to the next object, you don't need to focus again. All right. You can also use a program called Deep Sky Stacker. It's a free program and it has two different versions. One for uh, stacking your images for doing processing for astrophotography, but it has a live version vision, a uh, version of it rather. And then uh, it's really good. Uh, I like SharpCap 
Pro better because the Deep Sky Stacker does not have these additional tools such as polar alignment and the focusing assistant and a few other nice additions that make uh, me personally, I love SharpCap. It's, it's really good. All right, but you can, this is free. So, so many programs available for processing. I personally use Photoshop with several plugins. I've been using Photoshop so long for uh, my other types of photography and I'm a, a retired research scientist and I did all my microscopy imaging and other types of imaging I did using Photoshop. So I, I'm, I'm really, my mind thinks that way. But others use things like PixInsight and other programs. And I recommend heartily, again, if you're interested, just send out a blast email on our, uh, uh, what's it called, email blast. And guys like uh, John who use other programs, Chris Lassley, uh, Don Walters, they will respond and they'll say, hey, what would you like to try? And they'll make recommendations and they'll help you when you run into difficulties, all right? And if you're into the Photoshop part of it, I'll respond and I'll help you with that, okay? Uh, again, another one that's easy is Photoshop Elements. It's only $69 and it's a one-time fee. And with the same plugins that I use in a Photoshop and you do a pretty good job. So you don't have to spend a lot of money for good processing programs. All right. So of course, better cameras can give you quote, better results. So here's a picture of M3 with the ASI 290mm mini, again, black and white, but a beautiful image. All right. And this is with my ASI 533MC Pro. So first off, you can see the colors. You can see blue stars and orange and white and red, see them. And it, it gives you a wider field of view. All right, look here, look at this pattern you see here. You see the star here, then this the three stars. Here it is here, and it curves on in. So it's the same orientation for both photographs, but look how much more you capture in the 533 MC Pro, even though the central image looks about the same size. So you get what you pay for, the color image and the bigger sensor, all right? And the same thing here with galaxies, here's M101, with the 290mm mini, and here is the M101 with the ASI 533MC Pro. Again, you see more programs with the similar exposure times and look at the color. You can see all the hydrogen alpha areas. You can see the blue colors in the arms and then the central disc and you see more sharp details. Again, it's, you, yes. Were you resolving more stars at the core of those globular clusters with the pro or with the mini, uh, it seems like I, I see it's about the same. I mean, you you can see a lot more here. Again, look at the focus here. So follow this trail in, and when you're right here, look how much more. It's something that this little area here that looks like it's kind of all together. You can see the individual stars all here. See them? Yeah, I, I was looking at a slide, a slide you had earlier where you were comparing several globular clusters and two, the two different cameras. It, it was like about a quarter of the way into your talk. You'd have to. Oh yeah, well, I won't go back that far. And let, maybe till later. But, let me finish up. Like, we can go back. Yeah. Yeah, it looked like with one of the camera systems you were using, you were getting more. Uh, uh, of, you were resolving more of the stars in the core. Well, yeah, I was seeing more with the two hundred and ninety mm than I was with the SV Boney three uh, three hundred five for given exposure. Um, and a given gain, you'll see more with the 290mm. But both of them basically, the SV Boney 305 and the 290mm use the same uh, sensor, the Sony sensor, except the 305 uses the color, one shot color version of that sensor. Does that make sense? You can get the sensor either in as monochrome or in a one shot color version. Okay. So the color version, by putting on the color elements onto the sensor, it does two things. It reduces the resolution slightly, and it reduces the sensitivity to light. But it does give you color. Of course, a longer exposure would have given you more resolution? No, it, the, the, it helps a little bit, longer exposure, because you reduce noise. Okay. But if you compared exactly the same length exposures for both cameras, you always get a better view with the 290mm or with any monochrome camera versus its color equivalent. Gotcha. That's just the nature of the beast. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. So 
And as you see, more expensive cameras have larger sensors. So here again is the ASA, ASI 290mm looking at the Lagoon Nebula. And then here's with the ASI 533MC Pro. You're looking at a 299 camera versus a $900 camera. A, you get the color. B, look at how much of a bigger field. So you can see here the same area. See right there, it looks like a upside down, looks like a frown really. Uh, that's the same area. Here's the open cluster right there and you see it right here. This is all you can capture with the ASI 290mm compared to the 530C MC Pro. Now you can compensate for that if you want to take a bunch of these images and they're beautiful uh, programs in Photoshop and other programs that allow you to do mosaics. So you can take a picture, line it up with another picture that was taken next to it, and it fuses them so that there's no overlap of the area. And it's like, boom, now you've created the larger picture. But that takes time. And that takes a little skill using Photoshop, but you can do it. But I mean, the detail here is great. Look at this, the same areas in here, you see them right here, right here, and so forth. This camera is very good. This camera is very good, but again, it has a limited field of view and lacks color. It's up to you what you wanna see. And it's also up to your budget. What do you wanna do? And that's why I said, with a, if you already have a telescope and a laptop, for anywhere from $100 to $300, you can be right into doing this type of work. Either doing just the EAA, again, electronically assisted astronomy, so you can actually see things in your light polluted area. I mean, look, they have light pollution filters, they're okay. But a light pollution filter is also going to reduce the light somewhat. It always does. Anytime you add another optical element, you will reduce some light. And that's the case you have here. Here, I didn't use any filters at all in here. And this is the results I'm getting right in front of my front yard in, in, in Little Rock. So this is the difference that you can see with the cameras and with your naked eye. Okay. So you have to ask yourself, do you want this visually? M42, or do you want this? This is with my 533 MC Pro. Do you want that? And you have to make that decision and you have to save up your pennies to get the camera that will get you the view you want. So if you're doing EAA, instead of having to do a mosaic, if you get the 290mm, so it's like this, let's go backwards. If you're just doing EAA, you just move the telescope. You can move the telescope from here, which is what you see here, this area, to over to here, and you'll see that, and then over to here, and then you'll see that, etc. Now, if you want to make an image, you have to take the images separately and then create a mosaic, a fused image of the multiple images to get your overall, the whole nebula, okay? So summarizing, if you have a telescope or telephoto lens, then less expensive cameras are a good way to get started in EAA and or astrophotography. Again, as I said, if you start say, hey, this is for me, those cameras can also be when you step up and you need a guide camera for auto guiding, you use those cameras or you can still use them for doing planetary lunar photography. And there's no money lost. If you decide, eh, I hate this, it's a pain in the butt. Well, then you're only out a couple of hundred dollars as opposed to some people I know who buy their first camera that costs $1,500 because in their mind, they say, I've got to start with the best stuff. And I've seen too many people do that. I would say more retired people than people who are um, just getting started in their younger years. Um, you know, because I think young, more retired people have a little more money available for their hobby and they rush right into it. And let's face it, some of the telescopes that were donated to us were donated by people who bought these telescopes and said, you know, I really don't like this. And they give us the scope and they're out that money. Uh, and it's good for us, but it's a shame that they didn't think about it and start a little more simply and move forward with that. Okay, start with the free and inexpensive image acquisition and processing software. It's not going to cost you anything. If you like it better, then move up to better software. And there's tons of it. If you go on to the internet, you'll find them. 
There are also good, very good YouTube videos. If you have any interest in it, email me. I'll suggest a few. And I'm sure that John will, John uh, Reed and Chris Lastly, and then uh, Ryan uh, and who else? Uh, Don, uh, uh, why am I forgetting Don's last name all of a sudden? Don, Don Walters and Jim Dixon and uh, uh, what's my call it? Malcolm McGee. These are all very experienced astrophotographers. They're nice people and they will help you. Okay. Then practice, practice, practice. Again, if you ever want, I'll send you the, some of my earlier images. You'll, get, you'll laugh compared to it. This is what I took and this is what I'm getting now. All right. And I've asked this several times and I've gotten a few people, is there enough interest to start an EA and or astrophotography workshop or group? We can have meetings aside from these like once a month or something like that. And the newbies can present their, their photographs and say, hey, I'm having trouble with this and gain something from the experienced people. And then the experienced people can present some things and show this is what you can attain. For example, John Reed gave a great talk a few months back on using Photoshop and other processing uh, programs to process the images. It's a great, really great talk. I think, uh, John, is it still on the uh, website? Have you looked at for that? John, you're there? Yep, yes, he's whatever. Anyway, uh, John has a great uh, uh, thing for doing the processing and you can follow that as well as the YouTube videos that are out there. All right, does anyone have any questions? Michael, uh, do any of these cameras um, have coolers in them? And yes. Would you the more, just comment on that? Well, some of the, the more expensive cameras, the ones that typically seem to be above about five, six hundred dollars do have coolers. So my uh, ASI 533 MC Pro is a cooled camera. When you see the Pro designation for the ZWO cameras, that means there's a cooler on it. So the ASI 290MM does not, Mini does not have a cooler, nor does the SV305. I When I posted my images from the SV305 on the SV Boney club site, uh, the apparently I impressed the uh, people at the company and they sent me for free their new cooled camera, which is the SV405. And I've been working with that and I've been writing reports up on it. It uses the same sensor as the ASI 290 uh, MC Pro. It's a cooled camera. The 290 costs, I think, if anyone corrects me, Jim, I know Jim uses it and a few others. I think it's about a thousand or $1,100. SV Boney is selling their camera for 700 and it performs pretty well. So just for those that uh, would know, the, the cooling reduces the noise. And Correct. That, that gives you a little better signal noise ratio. It, it does. And, but you, the thing you have to watch out with is what temperature you set the cooling. Because if you set it too cold in the summertime, it causes everything to fog up. You get this big <laughs> film of uh, dew on it. If you set it too cold in the winter time, you can actually freeze up. You start seeing ice crystals forming. So you've got to play with that. So typically in the summertime, especially when it's humid, I set it at about minus eight degrees C. And then when I go in the winter time, I'll crack it down to about minus 12. And then I don't seem to run into any trouble. And again, to control the temperature, the acquisition programs have that ability to control the cooler. So S Sharp Cap has a thing where you set the cooler and it will drive the um, temperature that you set. Uh, I'll mention that uh, I was talking earlier about the BBC Sky at Night magazine. They had a review of uh, Dr. Bart's book, uh, but apparently Explore Scientific now has a, a 4K planetary uh, deep sky astro camera. Oh, I didn't hear about that. Yeah, and it, and, it got a pretty good review. And if people don't realize, Explore Scientific is an Arkansas company, and they're just, what town are they in, Daryl? Is it? Springdale. Springdale, yeah. And I, I'd like to go up there sometime. Malcolm McGee and a few others have gone up there, and they really enjoyed just the trip and going on the, uh, the store uh, 
front and, and going into the store and seeing all the different things I have on display. And they, they say the people there are very good with, you know, to talk with and get information from. They are. Yeah, they're, they're very helpful. Uh, anyone else have any questions or comments they want to put to Michael? Uh, did you see the comment, Greg, Greg and uh, Jane visited uh, uh, the School of Scientific? So, why don't you can you say something about it, Jane? Did you what did you like about it? Yes, um, we just kind of accidentally uh, went up there. We were in the area for a different reason and wandered in the store, and we're looking around, went in the wrong door, and. So this guy comes up and he's talking to us and showing us things and we're looking around and it was right before Greg bought his first telescope, I think, I mean, his first good one. And uh, anyway, we, the, he looks, the guy looks kind of familiar. Anyway, come to find out he's like the owner or whatever. He does all the YouTube <laughs> videos and everything. And we were just asking him, I felt kind of silly later asking all these simple questions to somebody who does so much, you know, but uh, it, it was nice. A big open showroom and everything from uh, STEM kits for students, uh, you know, basic, simple things to, you know, to their big setups. So it's worth a, worth a stop in. Where is that at? It's in Springdale. Uh, I, could, I can't remember right offhand exact, the exact address, but it's Explore Scientific. Yeah. Yeah, you can yeah, they have a good website. Yeah, they have a really good website. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and a good and Facebook page. They do lots of lives, and uh, it's pretty cool. Steve Roberts had formerly worked at Mead at a time. I think that's the same. Is that, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's Steve Roberts. Uh, he worked for uh, Mead for a while. <clears throat> when Mead got to a point where their, their product line and their customer service was lacking, and... Uh, the, a lot of people in the hobby were really frustrated with him, and he turned around and and opened his own company. And he took all that, that to heart. He decided he was going to make his customer service and his products top notch, and he's done an excellent job at that. I have to say, at a very affordable price too. You know, I just wanted to say about you guys who are doing amateur astrophotography that I've been super impressed. I've been you know, doing a little booklet uh, of observing notes. And it's astonishing what good images amateurs are taking. I don't think any of us, if we had photos set before us, could tell that these amateur photos weren't taken by the Hubble Space Telescope <laughs> or, or the Web. Or the web. I mean, they're, they're taking deeper space objects, but they're not getting better images, really. I oh, mean, they are, Jeff, but... Well, they're better in a way, but, you know, it's just, you know, it's all relative. If you go back and look at the books that were published in, say, the 70s and 80s, beautiful images, even taken with, like, the 100-inch hail telescope, they, these look similar to that because of these new CMOS cameras, and also some of the older CCD cameras. They're just so sensitive to light. Um, the days that some of you are old enough like me to have started out using film, there's no way. I, look, I'll go, I still go back and look at the old images I took with film, and I'm like, oh, my God, <laughs> ugly. This, this is a great way. So it's not only a great way to take the astrophotography, Jeff, but, again, to observe so that you can see stuff. There's so many things. I, I look at my telescope here and look at a rock. I go, I can't see a darn thing. A very dim object. And they put the camera in. Boom, there it is. Anyone else have any questions or comments? Jeff, did, did you have a follow up with that? Um, let me share my screen briefly. I've been doing something that Michael commented on. Let's see. If it'll do it, maybe it won't do it. Did it do there it? Comes. There you go. We see it. Oh, much better, John. I love that one. I did I did that during your talk. <laughs> <laughs> How interested you were in my talk. 
<laughs> yeah, I listened. That is beautiful. All right, I'm going to unscreen. No, don't leave it up there a second to tell them what you have. That's a beautiful image. Well, that's the that's the cocoon. Normally, uh, most people just talk. About, uh, can you see my mouse? No, I can't see the mouse. Arrow. Okay. Anyway, wait, wait, I saw it. It just flashed across. Um, there it is. Oh, you don't like this balloon thing. Apparently, the bright star there lighting it up. And then there's a dark trails away from it. Yeah. John, your audio is but, uh, your audio is a, a bit uh, wonky. You you sound like something off uh, Doctor Who. You sound a little a little yeah. bit like uh, Max Hedrick right. a little bit. You might stop sharing your video, you know, share your screen, but not your video. Hmm? How do I do that? Oh. I felt like all the images that were shown, they were just, they were really great. The black and white and the color. The lower left of your screen, yeah, uh, John, is a camera that says start or, or says something about video. Yeah. Well, stop your video. Stop video. So, hey. oh, you're still, yeah. still in the wax headroom. Yeah. So, I, what, so what, I, what John's uh, talking about, he showed this image earlier and he put it up on his uh, website. And I said to him, the other two photos I thought were exceptional. And this one I said, you know, I've seen this one before. And he kind of had this area kind of too blown up and intense. And I said, I couldn't see all the detail in there. And just with a little bit of his skill, look what he did. He made this. And now you can see all the dark areas while still seeing all this beautiful nebula. Jen, that, that, that's a great image, John. It really is. Wow. Yeah. Let's see. I'm going to turn the share thing off. Oh, the size of the sky is that. Abigail, could you repeat that? All right. Like, what is the scale of the picture? Oh, it's it's like, um, it's much bigger than the full moon. Actually, it's not a particularly small. Oh, here we go. Stop share. I'm going to stop, I guess. There we go. I get confused on this stuff. So, yeah, it, uh, um, it's a fairly big area of the sky because of the way my camera and scope work. Um, I could actually get the whole moon in that frame. So it's not, I mean, if it were bright enough, you could see it naked eye, but it's not, it's very dim. <laughs> John, not, I don't want to get us too far off topic, but I want to thank you and Danny for, uh, uh, Danny Flippo for all the work you've been doing up at the observatory. I saw in the comments, you had mentioned something earlier. Can, can you just update everyone real quickly about what you're doing, what you guys have been doing? Yeah, um, the, uh, we now have the new, connect to first fiber optic at the observatory and Danny says it's working. Great. Um, so we're lower cost monthly and way better bandwidth, I think. Fantastic. And maybe a lot more stable. I know you guys have been working really hard on that and, and you know, doing it on your own time. And yeah. It's, it's and the easy. other thing was the RV electrical, which it required redoing a lot of things to make that work. So that as well. that's and all I done. I just yeah. want to take the time to say thank you. Yeah, thank you. Does anyone else have any uh, questions they want to ask either Michael or John or any of the other astrophotographers? If not, Michael, I want to thank you for a fantastic presentation. This is an excellent overview of the subject. Uh, great job. Thank you. All right, well, uh, if there's not anything else, uh, I guess we're done for the evening. I wish we could have all been in person. Uh, maybe <laughs> next time, hopefully next time. 
And I'll remind you to let me know if you can volunteer for the Arts and Science Center uh, event uh, coming up on the 10th of November uh, from 5 to 7 p.m. Uh, as uh, I stated earlier, there's a lot of uh, people uh, there that have never looked through a telescope and uh, they would love to have us out to give them that opportunity. Okay. Thank you all. All right, have a good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.